Welcome to this new episode of Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD. Today, I have the great, great pleasure of having with me Jonathan Adler. Jonathan is a professor of psychology at Olin College of Engineering and a senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School. He also serves as editor of Personality and Social Psychology Review. Jonathan's research focuses on the relationship between the stories we tell about our lives and our well-being. It has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, National Public Radio, and many other outlets. In addition, Jonathan is a theater director and playwright. His play, co-authored with Jim Petosa, Reverse Transcription, premiered off-Broadway in July 2022 at the Atlantic Theatre Company Stage 2, produced by PTP NYC. He lives outside Boston with his husband, their two young children, and an, el and, and an elderly rescue dog. Welcome to Beyond the Thesis with Papa VHC, Jonathan. Thank you so much for having me. So just, just before I, I ask you to tell a little bit more about yourself, reverse transcription, I, I, my PhD is in cell biology, so reverse transcription, you know, it's something that elicits a lot of thoughts for me. Uh, can you just, does is it related somehow? Yeah. With, with yeah. The, oh, uh, RNA? I, you asked. I didn't know we were going to talk theater at all. Yeah. So the play um, juxtaposed the AIDS pandemic at the, in the end of the late eighties and early nineties with COVID. Um, and so we liked the metaphor of reverse transcription, both at sort of the cellular level of these viruses, but also in the sort of metaphoric sense of reverse looking backward and writing down, transcribing the stories. Um, so That's we're really amazing. trying to elevate those stories from, um, from the AIDS you know, crisis in the 80s and 90s and trying to seek out parallels uh, to COVID. There you go. So I, I'm super happy that I asked the question because this I, we hadn't talked about it until now. Yes, and, I talked uh, to an immunology colleague who got me way down in the weeds with <laughs> viral transcription. Um, and it was, yeah, it was great. There's so many, I mean, I learned so much of the science and the ways in which the HIV virus and the COVID virus are and are not mm -hmm. the same. Um, but also there's just so many rich metaphors in the, yeah, that's, in the biological that's literature. The, the, the double entendre is super, super interesting. But one thing is true is that uh, DNA, RNA, transcription, etc., came much more to the fore with COVID and is much more common knowledge now than it was when, you know, in the during the HIV And crisis. indeed, the, the decades of searching for an HIV vaccine yes. really set us up to be able, even though that those have been unsuccessful so far, yeah. partially because HIV um, mutates so quickly, so quickly compared to COVID. Um, mm -hmm. But it, that all those decades of research really set us up to be able to do the COVID vaccine so quickly. Yeah. Damn. Anyway, I'm happy I asked the question. Now, <laughs> so theater, research, can you tell us a little bit more about you, you know, who Jonathan Adler is, how sure. come he's in theater and in research, in psychology, how, how that all came to happen? Sure. I'll say a word about the mechanics of it, and then <laughs> I'll say more about the motivation behind it. I mean, the mechanics of it are that I have a very unusual academic job, right? We're talking to graduate students, um, some of whom are will be looking towards academia and some beyond, but I have a very unusual academic job. I work at a wonderful place called Olin College of Engineering, which is a small undergraduate only college outside of Boston. We're part of a consortium with Wellesley College, which is liberal arts, and Babson College, which is a business school. Okay. Um, and so students and faculty trade around. The course I'm teaching this semester um, crosses the colleges. Um, but because I am in the small number of non-engineers at this engineering school, um, but I'm not the psych department, right? So we have Wellesley psych department down the street, which means if students want psych 101, they go down the street. Um, so that means that my job, both from sort of a, I, really from a teaching perspective, is to be broad and integrative and interdisciplinary. And it also means that in the sort of, uh, one thing that's wonderful about Olin is that we don't have the traditional three buckets of research, teaching, and service that many institutions do. Instead, our model of faculty activity is a Venn diagram. Um, it is a three-circle Venn diagram, but they are called uh, external impact, which includes research, but a lot more than research. So having an off-Broadway play certainly counts in the external impact domain. Um, developing students, which of course includes teaching, but includes a lot more than teaching. So 
advising, mentoring, running a research lab, those kinds of things. Um, and then our third is called building and sustaining the college, which does include things like serving on committees, which I do, but it also includes other things like I, uh, using my theater director hat, designed our president's inaugural ceremony okay. to be sort of immersive theater. Um, and so that was building and sustaining the college. So to, the mechanics of my ability to do my research and edit a scientific journal and write plays and direct plays is enabled entirely because of the unusual academic setup that I have. Okay, super the motivation cool. for it though is actually all the same, um, which is that I've always been interested in stories and how important stories are to us as individuals and as cultures. Um, and that has really driven my interest both in the science of stories and also really in sort of the applied practice of stories in our lives, both in the theater um, but I also work really closely with a nonprofit organization called Health Story Collaborative, where we work with medical patients to help them tell the story of their experiences with illness and healing. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. So it comes from behind. So it's a, it has to do with your why in life. Uh, and then you actually found uh, a how. an ecosystem where you could, you can actually be a professor and do all these things with all these hats. It's different yes. Hats. And so I feel... <laughs> incredibly lucky when I was on the academic job market, I had I was mostly looking at small liberal arts colleges. I had come from a small liberal arts college undergraduate as myself at my own. Um, and when I so I had a couple of offers and I sat down with my graduate mentor and I said, I'm kind of thinking of taking this Olin job. And he said, there are no other academic jobs in the country like that. So <laughs> if you think you want that one, you should take that one because it will never come around again. <laughs> Um, oh, and he go. said very smartly, you know, keep doing your research so that you are legible. If you decide after a few years that it is not the right place for you, you need to be able to move somewhere else. Of and course. 15 years later, I'm still here. Oh, well, well, that that sounds like sound mentorship. Yes. Uh, and maybe it's something we can talk about later uh, in sure. the interview because mentorship is something that's very elusive to a lot of people. And that I always like to broach when when someone has good stories to share about it. Because um, I feel a lot of people are kind of or feel like or are like mentor orphans in a way throughout their graduate school. Yeah. Uh, and, and the ones who aren't, who, who have a good mentor, it's the, 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 um, the story they retell about going through grad school is always there's always something positive or more positive than someone who feels like they went through it alone uh, right. and uh, anyway uh, I'm, i'm veering off a little bit but maybe it's something we can talk later sure um talk about later now uh, as i mentioned i uh, first heard your voice on hidden brain and your story <clears throat> and you and about your research and about about what interests you in this question of what's the role of uh, thinking about your story your life narrative your you know professional narrative or whatever and how it's not you know it's something that's not set in stone although we sometimes think it is um and it was on this episode of of hidden brain and um the first story that you tell actually in that in that uh, episode is about you about something that happened to you when you were in college Uh, you went into this project, big project, life-changing project. Uh, you have to move countries for this project. There's a set time. You think you you project uh, what's what you're going to get out of this project. Uh, and I'm I'm not revealing any of this. I'm just saying it like this to let you then tell the story. But it also also to make a parallel with people who, like me, change countries to come to a PhD uh, and and have this objective in mind. And then life happens, and things don't happen exactly how you had planned them. Can you share a little bit about that that I just teased? Sure. I, I really like drawing the parallel there and the ways in which you've taken stripped the content out in a way to demonstrate, oh, look, the, the, the arc of these stories could potentially be very much the same, whatever the content. Yeah, for me, the project was really sort of figuring out my sexual identity. Um, I, you know, I was in college. I were, was very invested in my intellectual pursuits and had a wonderful intellectual experience for a whole variety of reasons. I 
had not sort of figured out my own sexuality. I was starting to think, oh, you know, maybe I'm gay and I need to figure this out. I was coming up on my third year of college, which is a time when many students at the small liberal arts college I went to study abroad. And I thought, oh, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity for me to step completely away from my life, try living in a, the world in a different way for six months, and then I'll come back. Um, and so I looked around at various programs and for a variety of reasons, I chose a program in Perth, Australia at the University of Western Australia, which is geographically about as far away from where I was <laughs> in the Northeast United States as you could possibly get. Um, and I went there sort of thinking, okay, I'm going to figure this part of my life out. And um, one of my strategies for doing that was auditioning for the theater department's play. I had done a lot of theater. Um, I mostly by that time was doing directing instead of acting, but you can't just show up and ask to direct a play. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll act in a play. I'm a very anxious actor. Um, and much to my incredible surprise, I got cast in the lead in the play. Um, and that experience was actually completely overwhelming to me. Like I said, I was a very anxious actor and I, it was a very strange play, a wonderful play, but a very strange play with very atypical dialogue. And I had a lot of lines and a lot to do as an actor. And it just completely swamped me. I felt like I'm going to be on stage in front of hundreds of people. I don't want to look terrible. So I, I really spent a lot of time working on that and it just sapped me of the energy to do almost anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up feeling like much of my abroad experience was quite lonely. Mm -hmm. um, and when I came back to college for my final year, it, it felt like a failure in a certain way. Like I had gone with this intentionality and then not been able to work on the thing that I worked on and sort of I came back no better than I had been. I hadn't figured out anything. So I just sort of put my head down and threw myself into my studies. And I did very well in college. And again, it was a incredibly nourishing intellectual experience. Mm -hmm. But my personal life was kind of on hold. So at, at that moment, when you come back, uh, you say it feels like a failure. Uh, and my experience of, of these feelings of failure is when you're in the moment, it feels very final. That's right. Uh, I had a, I had this one chance, and I missed it. Right. That's but right. But then you said you you know you focus on your studies, the the that personal work that you kind of wanted to have this uh, test tube where you could do it. You you still had to do it now in a different way, in a different right. time frame, etc. Uh, in in not in this kind of safe far away space where you had uh, <laughs> you had exactly. envisioned, um, but time passes and and you can start and when time passes you can look back to months before years before it's etc when did this story that may many have been you know you may have been heavy hearted uh, about it for a while yeah when did that kind of start uh, uh changing and and kind of you know sublimating and maybe you you started thinking about it in a different way Yeah, so I took two years in between college and graduate school to do additional research, which is something many people need to do to be able to get into PhD programs. Um, and again, since I went to a small college, even though I had a wonderful intellectual experience, I didn't have a ton of research experience. Um, so I knew I needed a couple of years of research experience. So I started to date and explore um, and come out to my friends and my family um, during that period of time. Um, but it felt very transitory. I sort of knew this was an in-between chapter um, that, you know, college was over, that I was going to do this work for a couple of years and then go to graduate school. And I didn't know where I was going to go to graduate school. So whatever I did in those two years felt, yeah, transitory, temporary, um, like practice. Mm -hmm. um, and so For me, the big turnaround, so the the getting into graduate school coincided with meeting my now husband. Um, we were just, it's been 22 years since we met. Um, and those two moments happened almost at the same time. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, uh, the, the, uh, the whole concept behind the work you do and, 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 Again, I'm just gonna just look back at what we just said about this this 
story, you, you build kind of a, a narrative. You pre-build a narrative in your head of something that you project is going to happen. Life happens differently, and this is this happens to all of us. Uh, and um, my in my experience, uh, and with, let's stay with, with graduate students or, or young researchers or, or people who graduate and then leave academia, uh, often they go through this experience of, well, these five, six years of PhD and ended up not being exactly what I envisioned. I am no long, I, I'm not a professor either because I can't access a position or because during the way, during the journey, I understood that it wasn't actually something that I could see myself doing professionally for a long time. And what I get from a lot of people is that they kind of, Free, they froze these moments in time and they keep the emotion, the negative emotion of failure of that time, either when they defended and they 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 now felt, okay, I am now outside of this community and I may have just, uh, just uh, spent five years for naught. And from your work and, and uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but the term is that you shared in the in the interview with Shankar was uh, narrative psychology. Uh, it feels like this is something that's easy. It's an error or it's a pattern that it's easy to fall into, but there are easy or there are there are ways to to change that to uh, transmute something that may feel very negative in our narrative in our story into something positive. Can you can you tell a yeah. bit of maybe about what narrative psychology is? Yeah, yeah, that's where I was going to start. So the sort of foundational concept that I think it's important for people to understand before we move on is this idea of narrative identity. So the idea is that when we think about identity, the best way to operationalize that variable is as a story. And it's a particular kind of story. It is a story that weaves together our past as we reconstruct it, our present as we perceive it, and our future as we imagine it. So it is this integrative story that unfolds over time. And so, yes, at any given moment, we're in the present and we're looking back and looking ahead from this current vantage mm -hmm. point and we narrate our lives to serve psychological functions in the present moment. Uh, we think about the sort of two overarching functions of narrative identity being unity. So you feel like you are the same person across time um, and purpose, that your st our stories tell us why we do the things that we do. Mm -hmm. Um, but indeed, those stories evolve. And what's important is that we have two roles to play with respect to these stories. We are the main character in our story. And most of what we do most of the time is go through our day being our main character, right? I had lunch and I walked the dog and then I sat down to talk with you. Um, <laughs> and so that's being the main character. But we are also the narrator of our stories. And that gives us an opportunity to step out of the flow of our lives and think about the story that we've been telling. And what the research literature on narrative identity shows over and over again is that the way we tell our story, the thematic variation in the way we tell our story is powerfully associated with our psychological well-being. Um, and there's, of course, a correspondence between the themes that we use in telling our life story and the things that really happened to us. Mm -hmm. But they are ultimately narrative choices that we make. So I'll give you a little example that helps interpret this shift in my own life story. So mm -hmm. there's a pair of themes for which there's a, just a ton of research um, that get called redemption and contamination. So in redemption stories, things that start bad and good. And in contamination stories, things that start good and bad. Now, okay. all lives have good and bad in them. So redemption and contamination are really about where you draw connections between events or where you parse the chapter breaks of your life. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the story we've just told from my life as an example, if you cut it when I get back to college from study abroad, it looks like a contamination, right? Mm -hmm. I had this grand plan. I go, I get the lead in the play. And then it turns out actually getting the lead in the play swamped my other goals. It all turns terrible. Um, but if you pan back and you cut to a few years later where I'm in graduate school, I'm in a new relationship and very much in love, it looks like this negative experience of college not being what I had wanted on the social side, 
this negative study abroad experience, that all is the setup for a new chapter that begins with graduate school that is both intellectually fulfilling and personally fulfilling. Um, mm -hmm. So neither one of those stories is true in a sort of objective sense. Um, that's not how stories work. Stories are not about objective truth. Mm -hmm. They are about the subjective meaning that we ascribe to our objective experiences. And that subjective meaning is fluid and elastic, um, depending on how we interpret the relationship between different experiences. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a super interesting tool actually to to be able to use in uh, making sense of, of something that happened, making sense of where you are today. Now, one of the things that I feel uh, affects people in terms of their narrative is twofold. It's the, the stories other people tell about you or that you think they do. Well, and, and, and I just said the other part of the twofold, which is how you think, what you think people are thinking of your story. What are they putting you as a, a protagonist or as a, you know, a second line character or as a villain. Um, and, uh, and I believe because there's, you know, uh, when you're in graduate school, you're in this situation of, uh, Un, you know, of a lot of there's there are a lot of unknowns. There's some sort of precarity. You may be more in more inclined to be influenced or to take face value things that come from outside. Sure. And um, and I wonder whether there are habits or there are ways to kind of safeguard yourself against uh, against this that you that you might uh, reflect upon and might share. Sure. I think it's important to introduce another concept from the scientific literature that I think helps illuminate exactly what you're talking about. So the concept are, is called master narratives. So we live in a narrative ecology, right? There are stories all around us in our culture, stories that are told about us even before we are born. Um, and indeed, as children, we are born without words, let alone stories. So we, this is a skill that we have to learn how to do. Narratives exist in the social environment. And some of the narratives in the social environment are incredibly powerful. Those are the ones we call master narratives. Master narratives are often invisible, but they're also ubiquitous um, and they're powerful. Um, and so I think you know, our own personal stories are always a negotiation between the stories that we tell about ourselves and the stories that others tell about us, and also the stories that exist in our broader cultural, cultural context. And certainly graduate school, PhD programs have powerful master narratives around what's expected of you, what success on the other side means. And I think many of us enter into PhD programs because we agree with the master narrative, we're excited by the master narrative, um, and we're sort of willing to do that. And I also think part of the graduate school master narrative is that you must suffer, right? <laughs> that, that that's part of it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, when we get back to mentorship, I'd be happy to talk about my own mentor who did not have a narrative of graduate school that it needs to involve suffering. But mm. one of my closest friends in graduate school who was in a different lab Definitely the master narrative of that lab was this is supposed to be miserable. That's the misery is your evidence that you're actually doing something important. Hmm. Um, I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think that we are always, I mean, so this is true in graduate school or elsewhere. We're always wrestling with the negotiation between our own stories and the master narratives. And often the master narratives themselves are very seductive that we're drawn towards context in our lives because we see ourselves or want to see ourselves in the dominant storylines there. Mm -hmm. um, but there are real consequences to violating master narratives. Um, and so when one does not live up to the master narrative of what success in a PhD program looks like, there are consequences, real social consequences, but also psychological consequences. Of course. Yeah, one one of them that I hear a lot is, uh, especially for you know people who end up leaving uh, leaving academia after their degree, is this loss of identity. So the 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 typical story is, 
I worked all these years to become uh, to be in science and then to become a professor. And now I'm not a professor. Now I, I don't know what I am because the narratives of people I'm talking with in 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 uh, non-academic environments are completely different from what I'm used to, and I, I don't even have the language to engage with them in a in a productive way right away. Uh, and and there's this, yeah, I don't I I don't want to misuse the term because you're the specialist here, but kind of an existential crisis. Yeah. After after getting your degree. I think that's um, because we think about identity as a story and there's one story about what it means to be doing this PhD. As soon as you stop corresponding to the expected main character in that kind of storyline, who are you anymore? You're right. Mm -hmm. You don't fit in the story that you've been telling. I, I do think, I mean, this is something that needs to change at the broad culture, the level of broad cultural narratives around what are PhD programs for? Are they just about producing the next generation of faculty members, or are they about producing, you know, not just scientists, but you know, people with a, an advanced and specialized knowledge base that could be used in all kinds of domains? Of course, um, right. No, that, I, that would lead to really different kinds of experiences. I'll just add in I, my graduate program was a clinical psychology PhD. Okay. Um, so that there were two narratives there. There was the faculty track, and then there was the therapist track, the therapist track was unequivocally a failure narrative, right? Mm. It's like, oh, that person became a therapist. That's not <laughs> what this was for. Um, mm. And that's terrible. The world needs therapists now more than ever. Um, <laughs> and highly trained, specialized, smart therapists is a great thing for the world. So mm. I'm not saying that all faculty in my program espouse that narrative, but in the sort of competitive academic clinical psych PhD programs, that is the master narrative. Yeah, well, and and in the the narrative that I remember coming out of graduate school was well, if you're not you know not going for a postdoc was fa was failure or it's not it, and it's not something that is said word for word, it's just a narrative. It's a, it's a yeah a narrative right. culture. It's something that's yeah. it's an echo that you hear and you don't it's know where it's coming invisible. from. Invisible. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And one way that I've that I that I try to share uh, with graduate students. Uh, that they they should have uh, a booklet of alternate narratives for right. their outcome after graduating is is Marvel and the multiverse. They they should entertain even even for fun this possibility of okay what okay in this universe I want to be a professor but in this in universe B what could I be yeah uh, do you think this is healthy because one of the the first things that i hear is but i don't have time to you know i don't have time to to even consider something different uh and it, this is a difficult conversation for me to have with these people because first there's this cognitive dissonance of well i just got into a phd program and you're talking me to me about something non-academic right. why right. Right. but uh what what's your reflection on this maybe on this metaphor of multiverses and and how working on narratives is not trying to be fake because that's another worry that comes with right. uh, with this conversation is i you know uh, it, it sounds like it sounds contrived this whole right. exercise i mean so right i'm just trying to trans so marvel works because there's the comic world i was going to say it's also like a choose your own adventure book do you yes. remember that from childhood where it's like if you want to do this jump to page whatever um, yeah, yeah, I love that. So I think I have two things about it. One is I think that's incredibly sound advice, and I'm super th sympathetic to the student who's like, entertain multiple life narratives. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? That's actually hard to maintain multiple life narratives. That's a burden. And so I, what I actually think is this is an intervention that needs to happen at the cultural level, not the individual level, right? Mm -hmm. Like so many change cultural changes, it's easy to say, you, the afflicted person, need to do X, Y, and Z to have a better experience. And would that help them have a better experience? I'm sure it would, but there's also some burden associated with it. That's but it. if we could change the culture where it's welcome to our university, you know, doctoral programs where we see many paths for you, like along with your graduate training, you are required to take a course in envisioning multiple paths post PhD. That seems like the institutional or the structural level change that shifts the master narrative that yeah. says, oh, actually, your job as a first year, second year PhD student 
is to maintain multiple narrative options for yourself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, by the end, you might want to specialize more because the truth is those different narratives are going to prescribe different kinds of behaviors, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to land the most prestigious academic job, you got to do a certain kind of work during the year of graduate school. If you're going to go in a different direction, you probably need to do different kinds of works. Or I was looking at small colleges. I knew I was going to need to get some training to be a teacher, which is not part of many graduate programs. The university where I was for graduate school had a graduate student teaching certificate program. And my graduate mentor was incredibly supportive. And I know there would have been mentors in my department who would have been like, that is a waste of your time. Do your research. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually think it's, you know, whenever we look to individual level solutions, there's some burden placed onto the people who are already carrying a heavy burden that the structural intervention would be better. Yeah. Well, one, one thing it makes me, uh, the, you know, the one idea that comes to me when you say that is because master narratives are difficult to change because they're often arcane. They come from a long time ago. They're well, well set. And, and there are I, people in power invested in them, right? As soon as you topple them, then the power structures of society shift with them. shift. That's it. So and, people have real incentives to maintain them, to maintain them. There you go. So it, it, it's, it feels like we need, you know, we as a community would need to find a, a, <laughs> a PR or a marketing agency and rebrand <laughs> the rebrand the, 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 the graduate school experience as and 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 get programs and get universities proud of having their graduates in government in the industry as well as in academia that's right and, that's and right. you know it's interesting i work at this small engineer undergraduate only engineering college and we it's very small so we have a very high touch process to recruiting the undergraduates okay. and to faculty but i was thinking about the undergraduates and one of the so the the candidates who make the final cut come to campus for, you know, interviews and experiences on campus. And they, when they get interviewed by faculty, they are, we are very explicitly instructed by the admissions office not to ask the question, why do you want to be an engineer? But to ask the question, why do you want an engineering education? Um, and one of my best students I ever worked with I didn't meet her when she was a candidate, but when she first came, I met her her first semester of college. She said, oh, I know I don't want to be an engineer. I would like to be, I would like to be the managing director of a professional opera company. But oh. I know that learning to think like an engineer will distinguish me in that industry. And that's going to be incredibly useful to me. And she is well on her way at this point, having graduated many years ago. That's amazing. So this feels to me like, she already had the manuscript for her book. Right. <laughs> for her... She was an incredibly precocious young person on along so many axes. Um, but yes, not everybody's like that. So so what can we do? So if if that doesn't come instinctually to us, if that's not in our you know makeup, you know, psychological makeup yeah. in our genes, let's say, to stay <laughs> close to biology. What are ways for us to take ownership of our narrative a little bit more and not be just buffeted left and right by yeah. what graduate school brings us? Because once you get into that roller coaster, it's it's hard to it's hard to to yeah. take to, to turn or to stop or to get off the <laughs> get off the 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 ride. Um that's right. Yeah. Do you have any well any I do think idea? yeah, exactly. I Go think ahead. that the that this particular frame of thinking actually is in and of itself is fairly empowering. So to alert people to two things. One is that they are not only the main character in their life story, but also the narrator, and that their life story is embedded within multiple master narratives, right? So there are master narratives of gender and race, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but that they, when whenever you choose to enter a new cultural context, which graduate school is, you are embedding yourself within existing master narratives. And to go in with some awareness um, that that is exactly what you are doing allows you to have a little bit of detachment and to say, 
I'm going to go into this and be fed a particular narrative about what's important and what matters. My job as the main character and the narrator of my own life is to figure out what matters to me and how I can leverage this experience towards that end. And again, it's like you said, it's incredibly seductive to get pulled into the master narrative or whatever cultural context you're in. That's It's easy. If your identity and the master narrative align, then you have no friction. Um, and so also, I do think people with the experience of being minoritized along any axis often are quite good at this playing the game and having an awareness that they are playing a game. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that's one of the benefits of the minority experience is all the time you exist in a culture that doesn't completely reflect back to you who you are. And so then when you enter a new culture, it's easy to have some skepticism, some productive detachment, even if you're still invested in pursuing the things that the master narrative suggests that you ought to. So I think for, for everyone, it's the, the, I do think the awareness is sort of like a crucial tool in resisting the downsides to the, to the pull of the master narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it does make a lot of sense. And, and you said it, you know, you, I, I don't think it needs more explaining or more or you were very clear in how you shared it and uh i'll make sure to make it clear in the show notes because i i do think it's it's the basis of the system it's simple is simple the thing the thing that's often a challenge is um getting people you know getting people turned on to these ideas early enough yeah and because often like people are coming from abroad they already feel that oh i i have embarked in this wonderful adventure this wonderful master narrative and i kind of can foresee the 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 result although we know that, that you know how that goes reality is always you know the map is not the territory yeah yeah <laughs> um but uh, i'm thinking of people i'm thinking about people who uh for whom it may be that they are uh, the first generation in their right. family to to get this degree there's that aspect too that to them it maybe even makes that master narrative more enticing um the people coming from abroad from places where maybe um relationship to authority is very different than let's say here in north america yeah. that have a that just that puts them in a frame of mind of obedience and uh and uh, and following and and not Uh, rocking the boat, uh, and but in a, in a way, because we're, you're talking in terms of protagonist or main character and narrator, uh, it it may also be there may also be an obstacle for people coming from a background where seeing yourself as the main character just that is already a is something that is seen negatively. That's true, and and I you know a lot of the work on narrative identity has been conducted in. Western contexts um, mm -hmm. with a sort of Western individualistic notion of self. Um, and so I think that's, I think that's right, that this may not translate to all international contexts where people coming, even if they're coming to the West to do their graduate work, might come with very different configurations of self and expectations for interpersonal relationships. And again, since the research hasn't been done sufficiently in those contexts, I don't know whether this metaphor is as productive for those folks and their well-being, right? Um, I just, there just aren't the data to, to speak to it. I, I think, well, where I was going is, I think it may pose more challenge to implement, yeah. but I find that the, the, the terminology you're using is fairly simple because narrating, telling a story is something that is human. That's right. Uh, That's so, true. so anyway, I, 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 the, the only thing that I was thinking was of, if people listening come from this or because i i interact with some students who yeah. you know and i i have some people in mind when i'm talking about this and i was just wondering um and, and i was just kind of thinking how this might pose an issue even to them but i do think that it's very simple and it and and that it's it's some you know it's um like i said it's a, a context and it's a terminology that is common to all cultures that's right. that's and right. it should be able I think to too you know you said the part of the challenge is getting them early I think about yes. the the sheer number of books out there for new parents 
like what to expect when you're expecting and right like just the number of super popular books about like oh you're about to become a parent here's mm -hmm. what you need to know um and right wouldn't it be great if there was some really i mean it's never going to be a bestseller if it's for <laughs> intern phd students but right some elegant book that was like here's what you need to know about graduate school that was not just the graduate school equivalent of like what color is my infant's poop um <laughs> but right but like because even those parenting books tell you like what to do like how many times a day to change the diaper but they don't tell you how to navigate your new identity as a parent no <laughs> this is right someone could use the handbook for like what do i do to be successful in graduate school i'm sure that exists mm -hmm. but also how do i navigate the identity piece of what it means to be a graduate student yeah no it's uh, well maybe it's an idea uh, maybe it's an idea for for me to think about <laughs> yeah yeah that would be great um now uh, I, I wonder because uh, so we went through your story. We, we talked about the basis of uh, the narrative identity. Uh, we talked about the very important piece of thinking or finding moments where you can. Maybe it's also that that's also the the the, the next aspect to it is getting people to include in their routine these moments of now I'm sitting in the narrator chair for 30 minutes a week and then um or do you have a week 30 who has 30 minutes a week to do anything that's good for them <laughs> i would say it doesn't have to be a week right it's almost like an annual review right like oh. what have i done in the last year how is it advancing me towards the things that matter to me what are alternative ways I mean, sure, if you could do it 30 minutes a week, good for you, but probably you need to be doing your research. Um, so, and maybe once a year is not the right frequency because that's too infrequent to really, if you need to really change course. But, but key milestones, yeah. Key yeah, milestones. a couple of, yeah, maybe once a semester or something. Yeah. Um, at the end of the semester, okay, what did I do this semester that advanced me towards my goals in a, in a sort of strategic and me mechanical way, but also like, Where's my identity at with respect to this project that I'm doing? Is yeah. that still working for me? Do you know? Let me look back over last semester's report and let me see where I'm headed next. And would you say it's it's it, because here again you're you're doing kind of this looking back? Is it useful to also have a, a part of that time allocated to where can I project myself in two years or in, in yeah five years? yeah I think again if we think about narrative identity as weaving together the reconstructed past perceived present and imagined future I think you want to do all three of those mm -hmm. you know what have I done where am I now where am I headed perfect now something we just brushed really uh, quickly before we started the conversation was mentorship you yeah. talked about someone about a mentor of yours and I was like wow that was good mentoring um, and I feel that if someone you know besides getting in tuned into this idea of narrative identity having you know if, if the person can find someone to accompany them along the way in a mentor in the position of a mentor it can it can be you know priceless in terms of how it can help them uh fine-tune their story maybe see chapters that they didn't see do you have just to finish the interview because we're getting to the end of it yeah. uh, unfortunately but it, can you touch upon that aspect of mentorship uh, yeah. how how mentorship happened with you for you maybe how oh, it's sure. happening today sure so I'll, I'll start at the sort of abstract intellectual first and then i'm happy to talk about my own experience I think, again, so we talked about our own identity being in a negotiation with yeah. other people, with the master narratives. So we need those co-narrators of our lives. Um, and we can find those in friends and colleagues and family members. The thing that's especially potent about a mentor is that they're powerful co-narrators, right? This is someone who has already succeeded at the thing that you're trying to do that has some wisdom about that. And so their opinion sort of carries more weight than your friend or your romantic partner, um, even than like fellow graduate students, because they haven't even, you know, I guess slightly more advanced graduate students might be excellent mentors and have some more power. But yes, if you can find a, a really respected one. So yeah, I mean, I feel just incredibly fortunate to have landed with my graduate mentor who was not only doing the intellectual work that I was most interested in, but also was just authentically interested in helping his graduate students 
navigate into career paths that were the right fit for them, not just carrying on his name as the next faculty member at a top university doing the exact same research. Um, I really think there, it's interesting in my little subfield of narrative psych, we often talk about the fact that there are so few of us at big research universities with graduate students. A lot of us are drawn towards small colleges. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a resonance between the content of the work that we do, which is slow, mixed methods, but includes, involves a lot of qualitative interviewing and really close attention to the transcripts. Um, and people who are interested in the slow nurturing work of shaping undergraduates um, versus being at the graduate level where you're responsible, you're teaching hundreds of people in the classroom, you're responsible for a big lab, right? It's it's less of a personal relationship with each person, um, but that's not good for our field. So, um, so, right, my graduate mentor has been a wonderful nurturer of my own path and many other people's paths. And I don't, I could imagine a very traditional academic saying like, yeah, but he doesn't have protégés at every mm -hmm. top university. So ha is that really working for him? Depends There's a mess which, narrative. <laughs> exactly. Depends which narrative you're going to follow. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Jonathan, we, we covered a lot of, uh, of terrain. Um, one, maybe one, one last thing uh, that, uh, that I'm going to ask you, and I, I don't know if you have an answer for it. One of, the things that what you just said uh, makes me think about is this issue or this advice that's, that's out there. And I've given the advice, try to scope. If you're looking to get into a PhD program and into a lab, try to talk with past, you know, past graduates of the lab, current ones, uh, current, it's always more complicated with, with current ones. There's more potential for, uh, <laughs> for, uh, you know, n not having such sound information. But um, how would you say, you know, are, are there pointed questions that you would say are go-to go questions when you're trying to tease out a master narrative of a spot that you're considering to go do your graduate studies? In? Yeah, I mean, I think that is exactly the right advice. That's certainly the advice I would give to anyone, which is talk to people who came out of that lab before. I think, you know, it's funny I, in a way, I think the, the question to ask is, tell me the story of your graduate school experience, <laughs> which is a very disarming question because it actually sounds like the most generic, you know, non-strategic question one could ask. Mm -hmm. But I actually think that disarmingness and the, the prompt to put it in storied form allows you to then listen for, how did this story go? Do I want to be a character in that story? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I mean, and I think I would ask, you know, I would always ask, what are the values at play in the lab here? Um, not just the mechanics of like, how many hours did you spend in the at the bench? But, um, you know, what are the values that seem to guide this particular lab? And how do those show up in your, in the daily life? Like, how do those values get instantiated in the day to day life of graduate students? Um, but I think, you know, when we're collecting people's personal stories, a suite of questions that we often ask are, Tell me about a high point, a low point, and a turning point. And those are pretty easy prompts for people to answer. And I would think high point, low point, and turning point would yield really useful information. Sure. So think about your PhD journey story. Give me the high level version of that. And then tell me in more depth about a high point, a low point, and a turning point. That's that's great. And, and it's a... a nice triad of things easy to, to memorize right. and i think people watching people listening will will easily be able to to use that in their explorations and i yeah it's, this is sound advice and uh you, you need to try and and uh and know where you're landing when you're getting into a, pro, a phd program because of these issues because you know there are different master narratives going on can you live within that narrative or not? If you cannot, it can lead to a very difficult journey through graduate school. Right. And none of us want that. We want everyone to have a good time becoming a, a researcher in, in their domain. Right. Um, Jonathan, we're really getting to, to the end of the interview. Uh, you were very generous in sharing 
your personal stories, but also your your knowledge around this. I, I'm really, really grateful to, be, to have been able to learn a little bit in more depth uh, about the subject of uh, of uh, the, the, the personal narrative, the the na narrative identity, and uh, I, I'm I'm sure, and I'm going to try to share this with the people that I that I mentor um, now. Maybe before we go, uh, well, one thing I'm going to ask of you is how people can reach out to you. But before you share that, is there, you know, for someone who is you know, down in the dumps, uh, third year of their PhD, thinking my experiments are not working, I'm probably not suited to be here. Uh, um, you know, I, I lucked out getting into the program, but actually I'm not made to be a scientist. Uh, do you have uh, a word of encouragement based on what we said for... for yeah, yeah. I mean, first I would want to just sympathize and say like, yeah, this, this sounds really hard. Um, and right, I mean, when your experiments don't work out, that sucks. And, you know, you think about the humanities or arts analog, there, there isn't an objective criterion of it doesn't work out. It means your ideas are not catching hold and people aren't resonating with them. And that feels terrible also. So... A couple of pieces. One is, of course, I'd want to normalize the experience of failure, which does not get a lot of airtime, but is mm -hmm. all of anyone who has pursued something hard has failed along the way. And certainly in academia, you know, there's all those studies that never worked out, all those papers that never got published. That is part of how it goes. So sort of tolerating that is actually not a signal that you're um, a failure. It's a signal that you're doing something really hard. Um, and really hard things take some failure along the way. So I would want to recast the narrative in that way. But then I would ask, I, I would encourage people to stop and think about what was it that you wanted? How does what you're doing align with what you were hoping for? Um, just because your experiments are work, not working out does not mean you are not a scientist. Let's not equate, let's not equate, you know, something that is out of your control with your identity. Um, lots of our experiments don't work out and science is a process, not an outcome. So learning to do the process of science is what makes you a scientist, not whether your experiments work out or not. Um, and then, yeah, I, I would encourage people to dip into the sort of grand narrative of their lives and think about, you know, even though this is really hard right now, is, is it possible that I'm in a tough moment, but that in a few years I will look back on this and see them as, this as the seeds of redemption, the beginning of a turning point? Um, and if so, then maybe it's worth it's worth tolerating and building up that muscle and the the ability to handle the the setbacks along the way. Awesome. I I, I love that you that you equated to building a muscle and. And uh, I think, yeah, going through graduate school does increase our fortitude, our resilience, and um, and and I like how this kind of loops the loop to the redemption that we talked about right in the beginning. Yeah. Um, uh, Jonathan, uh, I, well, before before we say goodbye to people watching live, where can people reach out to you if you want, if they want to just say hi or give feedback on, on something they heard? Yeah, sure. You, you, you have my website scrolling along the bottom. You can go there and, and my contact information is there. Perfect. And for the people just listening in audio, can you, do you want to share it? Do you want me to share it? Sure. It, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So it's www.jonathan-adler.com. And then there they, they'll, they can find, uh, they have a link to contact you. Uh, yeah. Etc. Perfect, Jonathan. This was a huge, huge pleasure. Uh, I, I'm. Uh, it feels to me that you had that you enjoyed kind of following me where I kind of yeah absolutely in this, in this universe of graduate school and being a scientist or or identifying as a researcher or not. And um, it's a lot of people are are struggling with this, and I and I and I strongly believe that you've shared simple and very actionable. Uh, tools for them to to use in little by little changing their view on on negative things that might be happening and uh, and building a healthy narrative for themselves i think it's very important and i, I think uh, your research is very valuable in that sense thank you so much thank you so much for inviting me it was a pleasure